that Trig's assistant, Sue Gage, is secretly a superhero, and she has been carrying for eight years. Batteries in her bag. <laughs> I've never used this I've never used them. <laughs> so that, that was a two-minute problem. So, Sue, thank you, Sue. Uh, welcome again. I'm Catherine Coles. I'm part of the creative writing contingent of the English department and the director of the Trius Writers Residency this year. So before I proceed with poet, essayist, and translator Donald Rebell's introduction, I want to thank Peter Trius, a Hobart alum without whom none of our Trius events this year or ever would happen. Uh, Donald Rebell is this year's Trius Writer in Residence, and he's going to read for us today and then give a Q&A afterward. Additionally, he has curated a wonderful reading series with three other Trius readers this year whose work complements his own, including poet and essayist Kazim Ali, who's going to read on October 4th, poet Bid Ramke on November 1st, and poet, essayist, and playwright Claudia Keelan, who will read sometime uh, in spring semester. Spring semester also keep an eye out at the end of March for news of our week-long Trius writer-in-residence, Justin Torres, whose first novel, We the Animals, was just made into what looks to be one of the best movies of the year, meaning Melanie Hamilton has maintained her tradition of asking people to visit our campus immediately before they become super famous and much harder to get. Thank you, Melanie. Other events to keep on your radar, Erica Tribold, the nonfiction writer and winner of the inaugural Deborah Tall Book Prize, which some of you who took Jeff Babbitt's small press publishing class participated heavily in the selection of, will be reading from her book for, for her book release September 20th, and some terrific grad students from the famous nonfiction program in Iowa will be visiting campus once again this year for a Saturday master's class on October 13th that's open to anyone who's interested in creative writing. Um, finally, the English department's rousing, ruckus, scary, rapid fire, reading the traditional dead versus undead slash living reading involving faculty and students will take place on October 23rd, so start preparing something to terrify us to pieces. Okay, here's the part of the introduction you can find out on Wikipedia. Donald Gravel is the acclaimed author of 15 collections of poetry, most recently The English Boat and Drought Adapted Vine, both from Alice James Books. He also has published six volumes of translations from the French by such writers as Apollinaire, Rambeau, Le Forbe, uh, Verlaine. His critical writings have been collected in Essay, A Critical Memoir, The Art of Attention, and Invisible Green Selected Prose. Winner of the Penn USA Translation Award and a two-time winner of the Penn USA Award for Poetry, he has also won the prestigious Academy of American Poets Lenore Marshall Prize and is a former fellow of the Ingram Merrill and Guggenheim Foundations. Additionally, he's been twice awarded fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, having previously taught at the universities of Alabama, Denver, Iowa, Missouri, Tennessee, and Utah. Don Burrell is currently a professor of English at UNLV and a faculty affiliate of the Black Mountain Institute. I studied with Don Burrell in graduate school, lucky me, and as I have said before, he is the great teacher of my whole life easily the most important and influential poet to my poetic practice I have ever encountered, period. He is a ten preacher for poetry. He's the one who taught me what poetry can do that nothing else can, how it can reach to say things that are on the edge of what is actually sayable. It's hard to explain what I mean here, so let me go somewhere else for a second, to a dear place. In his sonnet called Sonnet, John Ashbery writes, a building is against the sky, the result is more sky. These lines have stuck with me from the moment I read them. They have always struck me as actually true, in the same way that it's true that the moon looks bigger, more to true scale when it's on the horizon right next to a mountain or to a city skyline than it does alone in the tip top of the sky. The Ashbery lines get the scale right. It's hard to write about big things like the sky, or life, or war, or language, or children, or love, and get the scale right. I've been thinking about scale lately as I've been teaching Donald Rubell's brilliant newest book, The English Boat, and rereading some of the most recent other books 
As a poet, I've been wondering, frankly, for half a career, how do you write a poem about the sky, the result of which is more sky? Ravel's poems do it. They have this capacity to attach themselves to me right at the heart of my ordinary, tiny, quotidian life, and also somehow to be ineffable to scales on which I am not even a speck, as with the lines, God is in the kitchen drawer and his love is infinite. Or, whichever way I go was once an, an ocean. Ravel re-mystifies the language for me, makes it mean again in a way that is complicated and moving and all the more necessary in a day and age when people all around us are trying real hard to make words less true. But how do you make words more true? It's not by making them easier than truth, I can tell you that. I think of Ravel's poems when I read Ralph Waldo Emerson's gorgeous essay, The Poet. Emerson writes about how words which were once luminous and magical lose their luster and clarity as people use them to talk about stupid things. Poetry is a living thing, but, Emerson says, language is fossil poetry. It's the stone residue the living poetry left behind when it moved on. But the poet, Emerson continues, names the thing because he sees it or comes one step closer to it than any other. True poets turn fossilized words back into living poetry. They transubstantiate the language. They somehow say things, deeply human things, things that aren't actually possible to say, at least not directly. But they say them all the same and big as life. Poetry comes at truth sidewise, and Ravel's poetry for me has helped words regain their mystery, their gravity, their grace. A quick sample, vision runs up a hill called vision, it never comes down. Or, if she ever steps out of that entryway into the full sunlight, my heart will leave my heart, what happens then? Or, Gaban's overcoat, you should have seen it, was big as love first thing in the morning. Or, otherwise I am toys lost on the polar ice. Or, bees as small, easily mistaken for sunlight. Or, if you are my son and reading this, stop, run, berries underwater, and fill the bowl until no flowers show. I want to tell you all about it, to talk about how he does it like I would in a class or in an essay, but I don't have time here. All I can say is you have to listen to these poems in their full scale with your whole ears. You have to hear them and think, there it is, more sky. You have to take in the shuffling of metaphors the way he takes a word and reconfigures it, packs it full of new meaning over the course of a poem, pulls it up off the dead page and makes it alive again, shakes its fossils loose into the real and the true. Donald Ravel makes words themselves again to real scale, and you get to see, lucky you, I am so very happy to get to introduce to you my teacher, my poetic father, my dear, dear friend, Donald Ravel. Makes you think of any afternoon at five in late October, 
and of how the girl you followed used to disappear into the plaza. Nothing has changed along that street you walk. You watch a limousine go by. You look for actresses. The light is still what you remember having thought of when you thought of Venice, Henry James, or being happy. Blue with a touch of gray and dark. Only your nerves can rot. The rest goes on discriminating, particularly places. There have always been those places, real corners that can stay there and forgive your wanting a drink or having once believed that love should be conducted openly and in the daytime. If you could wrap your mind around the park the way these walls do, you would rot a little more slowly. Maybe if you dreamed the way a building dreams, you might even heal. Remembering that girl was not a bad way to start. Just follow her along the park side now, but go west, away from that hotel that always put an end to everything. At Columbus turn and head for the museum where they put the bones together. You'd be glad of bones by then, or with a bit of luck, side by side with the girl, having forgotten. Either way, romantic Venice is alive in New York again. The lights are as blue as ever. The park is colorful at night in October. What you came for were the curves. You got them. Look at how the buildings curve around and close in lovingly. You'd been following love then. Now, it is a street beside the park. So that was written 40 years ago in Binghamton, and as you can clearly tell, all the references to Binghamton in the poem. <laughs> now I realize that tonight not only are you risking life and limb by dehydration, but you are you are missing the evening news. So I thought I would read a poem that could perhaps successfully substitute for the evening news. Um, this poem is called Vietnam Epic Treatment. Uh, it talks about the days in 1978 and 79 when all the movies about the Vietnam War came out. The war had ended and we were all sad not to have anything to watch on television, so they made movies about war. And you went to see them because that's what the movies were. Vietnam Epic Treatment. It doesn't matter a damn what's playing. In the dead of winter you go, days of 1978-79, and we went because the soldiers were beautiful and doomed as Asian jungles kept afire, Christ-like in the hopeless war. I did not go to the end because it ended. The 20th century, it was a war between peasants on the one side, hallucinations on the other. A peasant is a fire that burns but is not consumed. His movie never ends. It will be beautiful every winter of our lives, my love, as Christ crushes fire into his wounds, and the wounds are a jungle. Equally, no matter when their movies end, hallucinations destroy the destroyers. That's all. There has never been a president of the United States. And the 21st century? Hallucination versus hallucination. In cold battle, in dubious battle, no battle at all, because the peasants have gone away, far into the lost traveler's dream, into a passage from Homer, a woodcutter's hillside, peacetime, superstition movie. On a cold night, Hector, on a cold night, Achilles. Around the savage and the maniac, the woodcutter draws a ring of fire. It burns all winter long. He never tires of it, and for good reason. Every face of the flames is doomed and beautiful. Every spark that shoots out into the freezing air is God's truth given us all over again in the bitter weather of men's hallucinations. There has never been a president of the United States. 
there has never been a just war. There has never been any life beyond this circle of firelight until now, if now is no dream but in Asia. Okay, so that's the news. <laughs> uh, so when you go home, you can just watch reruns of Friends or something painless. Sleep to sleep with the just. Uh, the rest of this little reading will be from this new book, The English Book. I teach, uh, one of the things I teach regularly is Shakespeare. I don't like to teach the tragedies because I don't care for bloodshed. Um, I teach mostly the comedies, especially what are called the problem plays, or the late romances, things like this. And they all have the same wonderful theme of reconciliation. Um, this poem is based on one of those Pericles, uh, who was reunited both with, with wife and with daughter. What are my friends? Mouths, not eyes for bitterest underflesh of the farewell. I was a man and suffered like a girl. I spoke underneath to where the lights of pretty, pretty, pretty whence they came to tell one God gets another. My friends are malice for God, tearing. In such a world broken only daughter opens to splendor. My first thought was that dying is a deep well into the image of death, a many of one girl. Later it meant to smile with no face where mirrors or mouths. Cupid and Psyche wore blindfolds made of glass, which explains why girls get to heaven early mornings and fell. Gods after gods we go. Still later friends shouldered high mountains to the lee shore. Gash to the gash a fountain of waters, the landscape to fames a single flower, amaranth. Magic hides an island world of boys and one daughter. I buried a pearl in God's eye, and yet he sees her, defames her, considers his time well spent imagining a continent of flowers whose final climate is a broken girl. Bells of a Cretan woman in labor hurled from a tower, flesh realer than the ground she hung somehow upwards, curled into the bloom of her groin, where bells are bees. I am an old man with a new beard. I am the offspring of my child sprung from hell. Shipwreck makes peninsula metaphor out of my hatred, her rape, and one bell tower. Confusion suicides the palms. Heaven I heard, where the juice runs from stone-struck flowers. At the end of the world, I must use proper violence. Nothing is more true to tell. Tell the taut strung higher calendars I've a margin in mind and new words, hope to say, catastrophe to hear, old confederates and inwood apples where apples never shone. Also tell of mountains shouldered underneath one flower called Amaranth. They tired of the world, who made the world this way. God never did, never will. If you were to call from the bottom of the ocean, the words, every one to me a living daughter, would shout wild mercy as never was before. This is a poem called Fresh Dante. I'm crazy about Dante because by a complete accident in the seventh grade, I was chosen with 29 of my classmates to take a three-year course in Dante all the way through middle school. I want you to imagine this in the seventh grade. Someone walks in and says, every Friday for the next three years, you will be reading Dante. <laughs> Turned out all right for me. <laughs> Most of the rest of my classmates are in rehab in one other part of the country. Uh, uh, fresh Dante. See. There's too much to, to tell you about, so it's pointless. Um, the, the, the reference to France refers to France, the rest will have to win. Uh, 
Uh, as of noon today, is not one cell of mine to lose the 11th of March 2001 ever lain with you by Verdi's Requiem, the audience only now arriving, the kiddies left freely to play with the garrow as thick as paint at noon today, winter. It comes over the radio. It is wax fruit. Not a saint but is footnoted. Not one cell of mine but urns berries in a bowl. Virtuosity of the half-man shames the concertmaster ever since you. Fiddle and bow man, burial fruit for Gabriel and Judas, footnoted, play against myself to lie with you. Berries are nice, lady. Christian is nice, lady. The soul of Toulouse rocks through. Creation is one way. Creation is the other way, too. They have wedged cathedrals between bookstalls. Between the edge of your sex and alto France gapes, it spills out of you, all the way from hoopla. Colors drown the angel and hoist Judas. West running rivers are hopeless. It's a shame to miss an hour even. I mean an hour of saintliness. As of noon tomorrow, not one cell of mine requiems anywhere. Color me a maiden berry underneath. Winter was the least of it. One of those lines is stolen from uh, Emily Dickinson. It's my favorite line from Emily Dickinson. Berries are nice. <laughs> it's incontrovertible. <laughs> I mean, happily, there is literally no literary criticism about the line, berries are nice. There is no subtext. There is no post-colonial revisionist reading. Uh, the Freudians just cross the street and walk on the other side. Uh, the berries are nice. I was explaining to the, the folks who were with me in, in my little workshop uh, that uh, Picasso is, is, of course, rubbish, and the great painter of the, the 20th century is Matisse. And this is a poem about explaining that to a, a rather famous poet. Uh, we were at the Museum of Modern Art together. And uh, we both noticed that all, all, the, all the tourists were in the Picasso room. We were literally left to ourselves with what is the greatest, greatest painting of the 20th century, Matisse's piano lesson. So this is good. You can go to the museum and see the greatest painting and not have to mess around with the Picasso's. So this is a poem for her about that. A few notes like planets of the remaining color, hunger here, sated only by distance, only by distance sated. There are no cabs. Our Spaniard, perhaps as near as the next room, would bellow pathos into the gash where child keeps his eye. Wise child. Tenderness is not for such, not for lines. We stare across the music, meeting you there. Planets of laundry and an iron tree, green for Christmas. I've invented a simple balcony for you behind the piano. Even in daylight, there stands a soul against the rail. Her tope is thrown into the traffic noise. A few notes, yellow as tender to the sun, hang there. Um, one of the things in this book is a, a series of sonnets for uh, Blessed Virgin Mary. Of whom I'm quite fond, um, and whom I hope returns the compliment at some point. I have one moment in particular which I hope she returns the compliment. That remains to be seen. Uh, I'm going to do one of those. Not the star, but homely grace and an accustomed tree guided the three of them as if earth itself were a slender, tenacious grip upon coldest air. Soil grew upward into trees. Uncanny grace was a broken, white-necked swan who birthed a lone god alive at the foot of a tree in the mess there. History consents to the miracle because it must, just as a sandstorm of atoms in Asia settles into the form of wings. 
yet Asia has no wings, and not any altars underground. With God's help, we have oppressed them with our wealth. With God's help, they will now revenge themselves with numbers. I sing of Mary, climbed out of earth alive. I'm really fond of the Tappan Zee Bridge. So you can imagine how upset I was to learn that they're getting rid of it and replacing it with the Cuomo Bridge. <laughs> There's no magic in the Cuomo Bridge. I remember just the sheer thrill of going with my parents to cross the Tappan Zee. Uh, what child is going to remember? Oh, I remember my first time on the Cuomo. Uh, <laughs> I'm not telling you how to vote or anything. <laughs> I'm just sad about my bridge being handed over to opportunism. <laughs> There's a series of poems in this book about the Tappan Zee Bridge. Uh, and this is one of those. His hands were anxious to be hands. Incomprehensible, not restful. Travel your eyes to the thin branch there for to see death twinned to sail. Whoosh! Children. Whirly birds frisk in the urban autumn mind. Death's twinning. Anxious hands make tea whose color fitful, whose savor bays October moon. I love the past for hating you. I love my hands for their taper. Two hands worried this summer pass nearly to death. Whoosh! We live forever. The trees are Norway maples, even there. There's also a series of sonnets in this little book dedicated to Samuel Daniel, your favorite author. Um, mm -hmm. I recommend Samuel Daniel very highly. Uh, he was the first poet to really work out how to write an English poem uh, usefully. And uh, even published, you can get this book. It's in a penguin, it's quite nice. Uh, and since history ever since around 1610 is not really worth considering, it's, it's too upsetting. I would, I would send you to Samuel Daniel. This is a little poem for him. Of youth time itself, say, Adirondack, Berkshire, Katahdin. Enigmas guessed that instantly, once upon a time. I am clinging to the torches of it all, white phalloi upheld, flowers walking unaided over rugged soil. Henry Thoreau was neither childish nor childlike. He was a real boy. He guessed instantly arrowheads, panopticons to find a missing house, and the poor hanged girl. Our youth is obscure only where it is rational. Louisa cut hair, a boy! And sends Honduras packing. God, my king, these pictures are free for the taking. With two young eyes, white flowers could walk all the way home under God humanly. Eden's the living end. When the modern was a boy and wild for it, one size fit all. Here in America, we hang pictures on walls. another one for Samuel Daniel. It is only recently the faces and dreams became unrecognizable. I live in a haze and sleep perfectly among strangers. How can you talk to people who don't know anything? Never read anything. Is 
I just said to the most beautiful woman over there, and the white hair, the carnal is clear, as though each wet petal of each flower were glass. I've never seen you before. There are no words where there is no color. There is only the reply beyond dreams, the west running river fed by clear streams and torchlights setting the water ablaze. This last poem is, is, is a bit long, not terribly long, and it is the last. Um, it's called the Glens of Kytheron. Kytheron is a mountain in Greece where all kinds of stuff happened. Uh, Hercules did some of the stuff. Uh, other people did other stuff, and it's all famous and did famous books. A uh, lot of stuff. And it has an epigram from Ted Hughes. Till the gold fields of stiff wheat cry, we are ripe. Reap us. Uh, there's a story in this poem about Actaeon. You may not know Actaeon. Actaeon was a hunter who saw the goddess Diana bathing naked. And Diana was so appalled that this mortal had seen her that she changed him into a stag. And then Actaeon's own dogs hunted him and tore him to pieces. These are men, Harold. <laughs> I begin to think Actaeon never changed. The works that followed him, the poems that leapt upon him and left him for dead, were difficult exactly to the extent they were rational. It makes perfect sense for nakedness to give way to frenzy. And the poems, let's be clear, were naked. Time was questions were put, clear as water. The goddess bathed, and time was the soft smile of water catching the sunlight on her. And the sunlight, let's be clear, was sheer murder into the same creature no human word used twice. Given to frenzy, nakedness smiles upon the breaking of men and dogs. How easy to lose all patience with chaste things. Lord, I am hoping to hear from you before the hunters and suicides make off with me. Lord, I am hoping to take your weapons to a tarn, freezing in the death of me. I shall harry the moon there. I shall have you bathed in the crossfire is a lion too. In 1969, a red stag made a cobweb of moonlight in his antlers. For once in your life, pray without ceasing. Pray the stag safely past the lion's tree. Actaeon never changed. Predator is simply prey to nakedness and reason. The poems have been out hunting all the time. Then it is Friday. Chris, might as well. Seeing as the rape weed, you might as well. The lion is no stranger. The belling stag is as familiar as the moon, but a strange suicide. Taken by legs, taken by sinews, kissing the cobwebs of moonlight, he prays the prayer I was not quick to say. Berries and hoardings, urban horseplay, short of the new, short of poems no longer old as I knew them, leaving the small schools for the main campus rape weed climbing, pale. It is Friday. Stars won't cross. Actia never imagined the frail, sheer speed of meat. Lord, eat me. Nothing else makes sense. On the far, safe side of becoming, metaphor is all love. The pure being of each nude above perfect sense. I begin to hunt words. The tension, the soft smile of the goddess eases a short while, reappears in a red stag's terror. Metaphor leaps and eats. It is not difficult. Love is meat. The dogs leap on Actaeon. He is human. I begin to think of time as anything in the gift of humans or a sacrifice to the long uplift of lions and the blood. Now dogs tear deeply into the living flesh. Each moment is a visible agony, and still the godly human nature remains unharmed. 
I never imagined the sheer frail of fear, so powerful. Legs and sinews turn into flowers. Between her breasts, the goddess shelters one such, one blood violet alive. The porch of heaven is littered with color. As familiar as the moon, our humanness crosses into heaven as the new poem. On the far side of becoming, a life's work begins another kind of work, but naked of change. There are animals, water, and trees. Nothing is recognizable in its old skin, yet everything shimmers. I am afraid of shrinking from the teeth of the cold water and from the howling trees. I perish at this point, down among dogs and upwards beside lions. The pieces of me are carried fast away by plot and rhyme. See Artemis bathing. The moonlight on her body is the mother of God. It makes perfect sense. I am eaten and fed, changeless into her breast, blood, violet, alive. I remain your friend. Thank you.
the only thing you can finally do on this planet is have the temerity to stand up and say, I love what I love. And let it go with that. Does that answer, Pam? Okay, good. And I hope they paid you well for asking that question. <laughs> Has anyone else been remunerated to ask a question? I've covered everything for you then. But back here, there's a uh, question. Oh, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, uh, so you have a lot of illusions, as you said, and kind of the connections in your in your stories, do you, or in your poetry, do you see them as characters in themselves? Um, oh, that's a really yeah. brilliant observation. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Okay. You nailed it. Yeah, I mean, okay. these, these are people to me. Yeah. Uh, these... They live and breathe in the in, in the day with me. Uh, they're, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm never alone. Thank God. I mean, I mean, that's I mean that's a lot about why we read. People who read are never alone. People who don't read are pretty much out on their own, which is why they're such easy pickings for creeps and liars. You know, you know? Uh, but you can't scare me. I got my boys with me. You know. And my troops, as Paul Simon would say. Yeah. Paul Simon's mother was my English teacher. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so that helped a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely, these are characters to me. They're not intellectual paradigms. They're not myths. They're, they're, they're my folks. They're as real to me as, as my parents or my children or my dear friends. And they, they, I hope they function that way. I hope they feel like presences rather than footnotes, which is why I never put footnotes in my poem. Because I think that's kind of muscle flexing. You know, and, and, and you know, I mean, I, you know, don't you? And you know, a lot of the time I pretend to know stuff I don't know, and then I run home and figure it out. That's fine. And it's called not being dead yet. And, uh, but yeah, that's, I wish I had the intelligence to, to, to frame it that way. That's exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you mentioned making stuff up there. Um, I was wondering, there was that bit in the poem about a deer being found in 1969 in cobwebs and embers. That seems like the type of hyper specific historical knowledge from some old newspaper article that would have to be made up. I'm just curious about that. Was that made up? No, no, it actually happened, but it wasn't in the newspaper. Uh, how did you experience it? Uh, coming back from Woodstock. <laughs> I saw a lot of stuff coming back. <laughs> I'm not sure it was all really there. Um, it must have had something to do with the war. But, but no, it was, I saw that stag with that stuff in its head. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> As Stephen still said, three days, man, three days. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and I, I, and maybe this, shows my age. I put so much faith in that magic phrase, 1969. Right. You know, but you know what I'm talking about. Some people say Neil Armstrong. Some people say Woodstock. <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> but yeah, so it's absolutely real. I have no imagination in that sense. I love the way it mixed with the, the lore and the Greek mythology. Some Woodstock for a minute. Well, I mean, if Woodstock wasn't a myth, what was? Right? <laughs> and you know, myth is just the way people try to explain the crazy stuff that's happening. And there's a lot of crazy stuff in need of explanation. Yeah. And I, I, I much prefer mythology to Anderson Cooper. <laughs> you know, because people watch the news to save themselves. They don't watch the news to be entertained. They watch the news to save themselves the trouble of thinking. Okay. I watch the news channel I watch because it tells me what I think. You know? And mm, that's worse. I wish it was entertaining. I'd rather just go, you know, go back to you know, Greyhound races and, 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 and the roller derby. You know, and, and, and Anderson Cooper. He's a lovely man, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely lovely. Anything else? I'm not tired, so if you have a question, I'm okay. Yeah? So, you talked a lot on 
I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. We always talk in the CIA poetry about how your narration develops and you shouldn't be the same person in the poem when you start as you are in the end. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if that was something that you were taught or if that's something that you kind of discovered as you started writing and kind of lived by? Well, I, have to t I have to tell you that I've never studied creative writing. I never took a creative writing class. Uh, not because I, I took some sort of high road, I just didn't know it existed. It was a closed book to me. So I'm pretty much, I had to make this up as I went along. But what I've learned was from mentors who became friends, especially the two dearest uh, mentors who became friends, John Ashbury and Robert Cree. Um, I, of course, worshipped them when I was a young man, wrote about them when I was a little bit older, and then had the great good luck to become friends. And it was from them that I learned what you were just saying. And why not buy a goddamn big car and drive instead? For Christ's sake, look out where you're going. I mean, get, riding a poem is like getting into a goddamn big car. You're, you're not capable of controlling it. You know? And you try to look out where you're going, but it's, you're not in charge. And Ashbury had the same sort of delight. And we talked about this a little bit in our class that if he was stuck, he would just look out the window whenever he saw that was the next line. And it worked out fine. It's about trust, rather than about craft. And I never studied craft. But I learned from my, my great mentors, Ashbury and Creeley, trust. If, if, if it made you want to write a poem, why won't you trust it? It's like, once you get in the car, that's the deal, man. Trust it. And that, that, that helps a lot. It, it, it makes poetry writing. I mean, I never understood people who thought that writing poetry was hard or, 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 or suffering. I never understood why people want to go, oh, I have to get away from my life. I have to climb a tree and write my poem. <laughs> When you're going to write a poem up a tree, that's fine. It, 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 try it once. No. Trust your life to provide. And every time I worry about the next poem, it won't come. Once I stop worrying and just go for a walk or look out the window, son of a gun, there's Paul again going, hey, stupid! I've been here all the time. My poems usually address me as, hey, stupid. Uh, which I like. I, I find that refreshing and comfortable. And they become familiar. But it's trust more than craft. I mean, when you die, do you want people to say, ah, she was crafty? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, no one wants that on their tombstone. But, you know, they say, I mean, he's a simple minded, trusting old soul. I can live with that. You know, my children sort of feel sorry for me when they try to guide me through the world so that I can experience as little as possible. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> I'm, is, that, is that a good answer? Yeah. In terms of like the writing process, uh -huh. how much like thought and vision do you put into after the writing? I only think while I'm writing. Because I, I don't sit down to write a poem about. <laughs> I just want to write whatever poem I can possibly write because clearly I want to. Revision is, 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 a, is a, it's really hard to talk about, I'll try. Because you don't want to mess with what came to you in the first place. But you can sometimes, I mean, I know myself well enough to know my bad habits and my vanity. And sometimes I'll put things in that really don't belong just because I was showing off because I was tired, or I wanted someone to fall in love with me, or something like this. And, well, that was years ago, but uh, still. There were, there were times when I wrote poems for that reason, not that it ever worked. Um, except once. Um, and that stuff I get out of. And that's just debris. It's not really revision. It's like getting, getting the lies out, getting the untruth out, or the vanity, so that the poem can just be itself. So I, I don't revise a lot, but I revise savagely. 
stupid, <laughs> wrong. And it becomes, it's very easy for me to tell them when I've been lying, or when I've been vain, or showing off. And the poem won't have any. And it's, it's so nice because if you get rid of that stuff, then it's so much better. So I try, I try as much as possible to preserve the original day, that day's work, and get rid of the, what Charles Olson would call lyrical interference. And that's my process. It's not so much a process as it is a series of events. You know, uh, today's writing, tomorrow's writing, the day after writing. Uh, because a process implies a product. You know, and I, I never, I never think of a poem as a product. I just think of it as a, as a more or less articulate companion. And it explains me to myself. I, mean, I never thought I knew that. Never thought I thought that. I always thought this is how I felt about that. That's clearly not how I feel about it. Son of a bitch. <laughs> how did this happen? So I'm not as smart as my poems, which I'm glad about. They're smarter than I am. They've read more. Um, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. What am I reading right now? Okay. I am reading a wonderful book by the French philosopher Pierre Hadot about Plotinus. It's called Plotinus for the Simplicity of Vision. Skinny little, I love skinny little books by smart people. Uh, Plotinus was this wonderful Neoplatonist philosopher who really espoused the philosophy of gentleness. And I, I really want, I want to know more about gentleness. So I'm reading that. I, I just reread you can tell I have a lot of time on it. The past 10 days I've read, read all the poetry of Yeats. Uh, some of it's good. <laughs> some of it's darn good. Uh, but I'm, I'm focusing, because the project I'm working on now, the book I'm writing now, is very much about uh, gentleness. And also, you know, I'm starting to lose my memory. To lose my uh, and so I want to say, okay, if, if I'm not going to remember as much as I used to, I want the gentleness to still be there. Because the people I've seen who get old and lose their memory, so often they're angry. So, so often they become vehement. I don't want to go down with that. I want to lose my memory, that's fine. Uh, but I don't want to lose my gentleness. So that I'm studying that, I'm trying to write about it very much. And to see the gentleness is not just a quality, but it really is a philosophy. You know, it really can instruct you on how to conduct yourself at you know, Wayman's or the voting booth or, or wherever you find yourself. Uh, and I'm working hard on it. So I'm reading a lot of Plotinus, that's Plotinus the philosophy, but also this brilliant, beautiful little book by this French fellow here. It's helping me a lot. It's making me reconcile. So, I brushed my teeth with the aftershave this morning. Worst things happen at sea. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So you talked a lot about your own poetry. I was just wondering, you've also done translation. How exactly does that work when you're translating poetry out of the front Oh okay. God! Well, I never translate to order. Uh, I only translate poets I've been reading for 30 years. Ago. Poets that I really feel I have a friendship with. So if someone were to say to me, "Hey, Don, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars if you translate this," it would be impossible because I, I I believe that poems are a current event. What I can do when I translate, say, Rambo or Pamela, is try to make a poem in English that would have the effect today on a reader of English that that poem had on a reader of French today. So, for example, sometimes you have to be unfaithful to be faithful. Something that was shocking in 1908 is not shocking. 
And if I was to translate it accurately, it would come out as a tepid, boring, tame little mark. So I have to sort of jazz it up to make it make it offensive now. <laughs> you know, make, and so you get in trouble. When you translate poetry, it's very clear. Half the people love you, half the people hate you. There's no middle ground. But for me, I will only translate work that I, I've loved for a long, 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 long time. I mean, literally since I was 20 years old. And I feel, and I, I feel, I just say, take me, Arthur, take me the uh, I'm your Lord. And we, we go from there. The one of the things about translation is it's always there. No matter how much I screw it up, the original French poem is just fine. It's always, I can't hurt the original. And it's, it's the kind of work that helps because you can't write poetry. I can't. But I like to write. So when I go to those times when I'm sort of dry, I can sort of lend my talent to these poems I wrote. And French is a language I know. It's my, my background, if you will. And uh, I enjoy it, and for some reason, there are people who enjoy it too. And so pray. I think I'm done, because I'm kind of out of poets that I love and know that there's only one left, but it's Mallarmé. And if you know French poetry, you can't translate that. It's just not possible. It's, you can't do that. People have tried and they just look silly. So maybe once my Amnesia proceeds along. I might forget that you can't do that, and I'll start. <laughs> so, if you notice me starting to publish Mallarmé, would you please telephone me <laughs> and say, "Don, you know better than." <laughs> and I'll say, "Thank you very much." And go back to my model friends. <laughs> Okay then, well you've been very patient and very kind. Uh, if you're going to buy any books, I'll be happy to sign them. I'll even sign them outside where you can read. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for coming, and like, I, like Catherine said, I'm going to be here for some months. So if you see me on the street, uh, cross to the other side if you want to avoid me. <laughs> or come say hello, okay? Thanks very much.